want to look at Cubism. This is a really important modernist movement. It was developed by Picasso and Braque in early 1908. Braque began an artistic collaboration with Pablo Picasso, and from about 1909 until Braque had to go into the war, World War I, they worked in creative dialogue, breaking down and reformulating the representation of objects and their structure on the two-dimensional painted canvas. In doing so, they pioneered one of the most radical artistic revolutions of the 20th century, Cubism. Cubism was a fundamental break with Renaissance perspective. It was essentially a new pictorial spatial convention that wouldn't change again until Jackson Pollock. Many, many artists looked to Cubism as they began to structure their paintings. Let's begin with Brock, lovely painting in the Art Institute of Chicago. This is Little Harbor in Normandy from 1909. You can see how Brock is beginning to turn everything, the boats, the mountains, the landscape behind, into these sort of geometric, forms, these planar forms. So in this painting, the whole painting is given over to these faceted and tilted planes that create volume and space. He's really negating perspective. There's not one point perspective. Rather, the buildings, the rocks, the boats are all piled on top of each other rather than arranged behind. They slip and slide into one another. Tonal recession is negated so that objects supposedly furthest from the eye are given exactly the same value as those in the foreground. And then there's no single light source. The lights and darks are arbitrarily juxtaposed across this painting. Landscape allowed for more integration of objects in space because you have an atmosphere that can soften the division between the object and the space behind it. The high horizon line that we saw from Impressionism here is utilized again to limit depth. So Brock is compressing space and he's using this shifting perspective on the boats, on the background, these faceted planes, in order to suggest that this is a new way of conceiving space. This next painting, also in the Art Institute of Chicago, Head of a Woman from summer of 1909, is another advance on cubism. You can see how the forms are dematerializing somewhat, right? He's breaking up larger volumes, the shoulders, the body, the head, into smaller planes, smaller intersecting planes, right? This is a painting of Fernand Olivier, Picasso's mistress at the time, and she was a model for a number of these head paintings and some of the sculptures that he would make where he's exploring cubism. In this painting, the contrast between the naturalistic still life in the background that you can see to the right, and then this boldly faceted figure in the foreground illustrates this you know, aggressive avant-garde stage of Picasso's evolution of cubism. Again, look at Olivia's bun, for example, her hair which would normally not be able to be seen from the front, but in this case, it's brought into full view. So he's looking at various sides of the model and displaying them all simultaneously. In the sculpture, Head of a Woman from 1909, again, he is trying to work out some of the painting strategies through sculpture. He's testing his new method in sculpture. So here is an early bronze cast of Fernand Olivier, and the artist has energized the head through this dynamic torsion of the neck, replacing the relaxed fleshy folds that we saw in the painting, those sort of faceted planes of, of her flesh, with an emphasis on the taut curve of the back of the neck as the head bends and twists in space. 
Although Cubism was to exert an enormous influence on the move towards abstraction among many artists to follow, Picasso and Braque, in this early part of the century, Fernand Olivier reminds us that Cubism itself was firmly rooted in representation. This last example of Cubism is by Picasso, again, Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, made in 1910. Now, this is an important example of high Cubism in the museum collection. The subject of this classic portrait, it's not going to be classic in the way that it's conceived, but the subject is classic. It's a portrait of Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, a German-born art dealer. He was a writer and a publisher as well. And Kahnweiler opened an art gallery in Paris in 1907 and in 1908 began representing Picasso, whom he introduced to Georges Braque. Kahnweiler was a great champion of the artist's revolutionary experiment with Cubism and purchased the majority of their paintings between 1908 and 1915. He also wrote an important book, The Rise of Cubism, in 1920, which offered a theoretical framework for the movement. So here he is. Kahnweiler had to sit in front of Picasso almost 30 times for this particular portrait. High Cubism. Cubism is relinquishing one point perspective. No longer that illusionistic rendering that we saw from the Renaissance. Instead, this is as if Picasso walked all around Kahnweiler, 360 degrees around Kahnweiler, and then presented all of the many perspectives that he saw, the back, the side. He presented all of these perspectives on the flat plane of the surface of the picture. So it's almost like a crystalline structure. This is very different from Renaissance perspective. Here we have a simultaneous display of multiple perspectives, multiple perspectives in one vision. So you see how these planes hover in an indeterminate way, overlapping and interpenetrating. And really there's no distinction between the figure and the ground. Lines inside the composition continue out into the surrounding space. It is one scintillating surface. Note the rich chiaroscuro. This is a term from the Renaissance again, which that's about shading, lights and dark. It's a traditional painting technique used to model forms. But here he's not using chiaroscuro to model the form, but it's still in play, light and shade. And the brushwork, this rich brushwork that you can see, this texture, the brushwork helps blend the parts, the various perspectives of Kahnweiler. Now Picasso would keep some visual cues that were more traditionally modeled. So you can see a more traditional rendering of a wave of hair or the knot of his tie or the watch chain. And Picasso did this very deliberately to show viewers how far he departed from the tradition, right? He was so avant-garde, he wanted to remind everybody of how avant-garde he was. So there's this careful balance between representation and abstraction, if you will, in Cubism. Both Picasso and Brock, in fact, were really distressed. They were quite bummed when a critic would ignore or overlook the representational aspect of the work. When the critics called it abstract, they said, no, 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 no. Cubism retains the imagery of the outside world. It's just imagery of the outside world mentally broken up, conceptually conceived then, right? Reconstituted on the canvas. Cubism is emerging in the larger social fabric, a, a moment when many scientists and philosophers are questioning knowledge. It's very interesting, the parallels. Henri Bergson, the philosopher, for instance, is lecturing on the metaphysical at the Sorbonne. He's lecturing in 1911 about flux and chaos. In fact, he gave two lectures at the time called The Perception of Change.
A few years later in 1920, we have Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. And here again, the scientist is questioning knowledge, questioning the knowledge of physical properties of a particle. And then the discussion of the fourth dimension, the so-called fourth dimension, or non-Euclidean geometry, was being put forward by a mathematician named Maurice Princet. And in fact, Princet hung out with Picasso, which is quite interesting that you have a mathematician hanging out in the Montmartre bars and cafes with the artists, talking about what is the next dimension, that what we see in Renaissance perspective is not really what we see, cubism.